Why Democracy Matters event with Unlock Democracy. My name is Sam Coates. I'm the campaigns officer at Unlock Democracy, and I'm going to be um, looking after um, everyone tonight and introducing our speakers. So, like I said, please use the chat if um, you want to introduce yourself. So, before I give us a introduce our speakers, I just wanted to give you an overview of what we're doing with this event series. So. We're trying to explore some of the big issues that we need to think about as we try and emerge from um, COVID and trying to rebuild our societies and rebuild our democracies along um, with that. So rather than thinking about the individual policy issues that we need to uh, address to improve people's lives and not make the mistakes that we had before, we need to think about the whole system that um, the whole the whole system that allows those decisions to be made. So. If we have closed political systems that don't allow public participation, for example, then we shouldn't be surprised if those systems are not reflecting the wishes of the people. So before we go any further, I just wanted to go through a couple of ground rules. So firstly, please respect each other as much as you would in, in real life and face to face. We, we don't want to see any bigotry of any kind, obviously. And you might be called upon to turn on your video to ask a question. So if you do that, please make sure that you mute yourself again once you've finished speaking. So this is how the Q&A um, will work later on. You can choose to join the webinar with or without video. And you can use the raise hand function to, uh, to, use, to ask a question about the webinar. Uh, if you've got a problem, for example, my colleague Trudy, who's posting in the chat, will be able to, to help you out. Please change your name using the rename button. So you can use whichever name you want to be addressed by. And it'd be great too if you can put some pronouns either in there or uh, when you introduce yourself, because it's a, it's a good mark of respect just to know that we're referring to people how they want to be referred to. So quick overview of who's going to be talking to us um, this evening. Firstly, we'll be having Thorvaldir Gothalsson, who's a professor of economics at the University of Iceland and has been very involved in the citizens' assemblies that have been going on in there since the early uh, 2010s, um, when the country was embroiled in a massive financial crisis. We've also got with us Valeria Kakamor Vidal, who's a, a political advisor for Revolución Democratia, Democratica, sorry, which is one of the um, main uh, political actors in the huge movements that we've been seeing there recently to change the, the constitution of the country. So um, two uh, global examples of what's going on to really boost people power that I'm really excited to, to hear from this evening. So um, the speakers will run on until about 6.20 UK time, at which point we will have a Q&A. And there's two ways you can take part in that. If you would rather that you just submit your question by text, you can do so by using the Q&A box that you have on the uh, Zoom toolbar and you can enter your question by text there. Or if you want to turn on your video to ask your question at the time, you can just wait until we move to the Q&A session proper and then say, I have a question in the chat box. My colleague Trudy will put you in the queue to ask your question and you'll be unmuted to ask that question when you're called upon. So before we move on to the speakers, we wanted to give you an overview of how big decisions are made in, in the UK and how that, might, how that might be changing and how we might want that to change in the future. So in the UK, um, it's a system where basically the elected government has very few restrictions on what it can do. We vote to elect MPs under a flawed voting system where the majority of votes, the majority of voices are not reflected in who represents them in Parliament. The government then has a majority that can decide to do pretty much anything at once, whatever laws it passes stands. So for example, we have a Human Rights Act in the UK, but that could be repealed by a majority of one in the Westminster Parliament. We also have devolved parliaments in Scotland, Wales and Northern, Rock, Northern Ireland, which in theory could also be repealed and abolished by Westminster in the same way. Even MPs of the governing party have very few ways to block abuses of power. The government, they're not incentivized to rebel, in fact it's quite the, the opposite. Courts can intervene if a law is broken, 
but those laws can just be changed by Parliament. And one really good example we've seen in the last couple of weeks where the power of Parliament is not really um, effective is, is that there was a long delayed report into Russian interference in UK elections where the International Security Committee launched that report, heavily redacted, and it had a list of cross-party recommendations for things that should happen in the, in the future. The government rejected all of those. And on top of that, the public have no formal role outside of elections. So we get our vote once every few years, and the government can run consultations on certain policy changes, but they're not obliged to do anything other than consider them. So they, they, could, be, they, they, they could be ignored entirely. And finally, and very importantly, we have the use of referendums. And in the UK, this, these have been used very, in a very ad hoc way. The whole of the UK has only had a referendum twice in its history. The most recent one is, of course, the referendum on membership of the European Union. And they cannot be triggered by the public. They can only be triggered by MPs voting in Parliament. And they're not binding, which means that the government doesn't actually have to influence the results of that. So we had in the UK in last year this really big problem where the principle of an idea should leave the EU was voted on, it voted yes, but there was no um, discussion among the public or um, consultation about what that actually meant. The government just decided what the meaning of that vote was. So that's going to be changing possibly um, in the next few months or years. The Conservative government that we have now had in its manifesto a list of changes that they wanted to do, including changing the use of judicial review which could make it more difficult to challenge abuses of government power. So that's something that uh, Unlock Democracy will be campaigning on in the future. So what we're talking about tonight is the nature of reforms to, to states. Who is that reform for? Who is driving it and to what ends? And whose interests will it serve? And I think that the examples we'll be hearing from different countries this evening will be a really, um, a really good way to address those questions. So we're now going to run our poll. So just to get everyone going, I want to ask you what you think about this question. So should governments be able to make big political decisions without consulting the public? So you have a screen that should have popped up for you now. You can vote in that. I'm just going to keep it open for about 30 seconds just to give everyone the chance to have their say. Very exciting seeing these results coming in 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 real time. It's quite an interesting one. Okay, so most people have voted, so we're going to close the voting in a few seconds' time now. Okay, so interesting results there. Only one person thinks that government should be able to make big political decisions. The most popular one, very uh, narrowly, is only in some cases. And yeah, um, if you haven't done so already, put some your thinking behind that in the chat so others can see it. And then obviously many people say no, um, the public should be consulted on that. Okay, so quickly now before we, before we move to the speakers, I wanted to highlight a lot of Moxie's principles for a democratic future, which is something we launched last week, which is that, as I've outlined in the UK, the public has a very limited role outside of elections in the decisions that actually affect our lives. So as we're trying to emerge from the COVID crisis, we've seen in civil society and organic movements that people have the capacity to take part and participate in decision making. And here are some principles that we want any changes by the government in the future to follow. So the right to an accountable government that we can effectively scrutinise is the first one. And number two is the one that this event tonight is themed on, the right to decide any big reforms to our political system together, not politicians doing it on our behalf. Number three is the right to exert accountability over those trying to distort our democracy. Number four is the right to define what democracy means to us. And five, a political system resilient for the future, built by us, for us. So we'll talk more about that um, towards the end. But now I'm going to um, hand over very shortly to Thorvald Gopalsson, 
who has been involved in grassroots um, movement in Iceland to try and change the, the constitution of that country and will be telling us about a really exciting process that's been going on for a number of years now. So I'm going to turn off my screen sharing now so that um, Lavelle can turn his on, but we'll get you unmuted now and uh, can't wait to hear from you. There we go. I think we've got you now, the belt here. It says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay, let's fix that then. Share screen? So, yes. There we go. There we go. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, be with you here. I was asked to make a few comments about the Icelandic um, struggle because in Iceland, like in uh, several other places around the world, democracy is presently under stress. Let me give you some background to start with. Uh, human rights are inalienable rights. Uh, violations are subject to global law, therefore, under internationally certified and binding human rights agreements. I think democracy needs to be viewed as a human right. Many people live under democracy than, uh, uh, more than ever before, that is true, but even so, democracy is under stress. And the chart shows you uh, the democracy score awarded by Freedom House to a few places. And you see when you compare uh, uh, 2013 with 2020, that uh, democracy has been in decline uh, in uh, all the countries shown, not only in China and Russia, but also in the UK and the US and uh, in Poland and in Iceland. Actually, there are uh, more countries that have experienced a decline in their democracy over the past 15 years than there are countries that have uh, experienced uh, uh, the advance of uh, democracy. So let me tell you the Iceland story. Iceland's financial system collapsed in 2008. This hit the uh, world news uh, uh, around the globe. And then uh, in consequence, uh, three years later in 2011, uh, parliament arranged for a constitutional council directly elected by the people uh, to draft a new constitution. And this was approved by uh, two thirds of the voters in a national referendum held by parliament uh, the following year, 2012, only to be hijacked by Parliament in 2013 and kept on ice ever since. So what happened? Well, in 2008, there was this financial collapse that I mentioned, uh, by some measures the greatest on record anywhere. And people took to the streets, banging their pots and pans. And this led to a change of government, a new election uh, the following year, 2009. And uh, this government decided to give in to the demands of the people for uh, constitutional reform. So in 2010, a national forum was convened. A representative of uh, the general population. 
And the next step was uh, for parliament to hold uh, a constituent assembly election where 25 representatives of the people uh, elected from a, a roster of uh, 520 some uh, candidates um, to draft the constitution. And in 2011, uh, the constituent assembly so elected uh, was at work for four months and it passed uh, its uh, new constitution bill uh, unanimously with 25 votes against zero with no abstentions. This was a unique outcome of uh, uh, in constitutional history. You know, in Philadelphia in 1787, it was two thirds against one third and not uh, 25 against zero. And then parliament in 2012 held a national referendum uh, where the bill was approved by 67% uh, of the voters against um, 33%. But then in 2013, uh, just before uh, a parliamentary election, parliament failed to ratify the bill. And in this election, the old rascals were brought back to office with a tiny minority, majority. And uh, there, the uh, bill that the people had approved in a national referendum was uh, still kept on ice. And uh, one uh, scandal followed another. Uh, when the Panama Papers scandal broke in 2016, it featured uh, no fewer than three Icelandic uh, government ministers. And then last year in 2019, there was a huge bribery scandal that has uh, landed uh, a number of high-ranking uh, um, Namibian officials in jail. Uh, the scandal uh, surrounds um, uh, alleged bribe payments made by Icelandic oligarchs. And as we speak in 2020, the Constitution Bill is still uh, being held hostage by Parliament, which, as I see it, uh, continues to play with fire, threatening Iceland's age-old uh, democracy by uh, not respecting uh, the clear uh, result of uh, a national referendum called by Parliament. So why is the new constitution bill so popular? Why did it win 67% of the vote in the national referendum in 2012? I think uh, certain key features of the process help explain this. The first is the national forum that was held in 2010. Uh, at the forum, uh, there were randomly selected uh, individuals, 950 of them, uh, from the National Register, and they were supervised by foreign experts in collective intelligence. That's the branch of social science that has uh, uh, found that groups of people make better decisions uh, than uh, individuals. And the beauty of the National Forum was that every Icelandic citizen aged uh, from 18 uh, to 92 had an equal chance of being selected, being invited to a seat uh, at the table, at the forum. And uh, that is how the forum was uh, as a representative of the will of the uh, Icelandic, Icelandic nation as possible. The forum uh, declared at the end of its deliberations that a new constitution is needed and that it should uh, include provisions on national ownership of natural resources, uh, equal weight of votes, uh, and more. And then the Constitutional Council that was elected in the special election that I uh, mentioned uh, respected this declaration. And crowdsourcing was employed uh, through an open interactive website that attracted uh, significant input from uh, many people from all walks of life. So there was a feeling of ownership among uh, the general public, those who decided to accept the Council's offer of uh, uh, participation. And the Council itself, the 25 people uh, uh, who uh, were uh, elected to sit there, was quite representative of uh, the voting public. So in view of this, we need to ask, uh, so why is the bill then being held uh, hostage by parliament? I think the main reason is uh, to be found in uh, two key provisions in uh, uh, the bill. 
As the National Forum prescribed, and as the Council decided with a huge majority, there is a provision there that declares natural resources, fish and energy, uh, to be the property of the nation, as opposed to being the de facto property of the uh, uh, small uh, group of um, oligarchs that have basically been able to utilize Iceland's uh, fisheries resources uh, free of charge uh, for 30 years. And uh, in the referendum, there was a special question about this, and 83% of the voters uh, said yes. We want natural resources to be declared in the constitution to be the property of the nation. The second key provision has to do with electoral reform. Iceland has never had one person, one vote, because we have an electoral system in which uh, voters in the rural areas have far more say in parliamentary elections than uh, residents in the uh, uh, Reykjavik area in the southwestern corner of the country, where two thirds of the uh, people live. So there is a provision in the uh, new constitution that proscribes um, equal apportionment of seats in parliament. And there was also a special question in the referendum about this particular provision, as 67 of the uh, voters said yes. And as you can imagine, uh, sitting members of parliament from rural areas uh, are nervous about their uh, possibility of re-election uh, under a new constitution. So they have an incentive to uh, block it, as many of them have uh, tried to do. But there are other uh, important uh, provisions on transparency, for example, including protection of whistleblowers, on environmental protection, and um, much more. And uh, really the preamble, in particular the first sentence, uh, says it all. It says, we, the people of Iceland, wish to create a just society with equal opportunities for everyone. So this brings me to my conclusion. Uh, democracy as a human right is inviolable. This means that politicians must never disrespect results of national referenda, whether they like the uh, outcome or not. And this leads me to my favorite uh, definition of democracy that I learned from uh, Lord George Brown, who was uh, um, Foreign Secretary uh, of the United Kingdom in the uh, 1960s. I heard him say, there shall be no one to stop us from being stupid, if stupid we want to be. The beauty of a uh, uh, national referenda is that everyone is bound to respect the result, uh, whether they like it or not. If they don't like it, they can take up issues again and arrange for a new referendum to be held. But democracy is not only good um, in its own right, uh, it is also good because uh, evidence seems to suggest that democracy goes hand in hand with other things that we care for, like economic growth and social welfare, including education, public health, and income equality, as well as transparency, as opposed to corruption. So we need democracy, we need it more than ever before, not only because democracy is a sine qua non in a civilized society, but also because of uh, its benign connection to other things we care about, like economic and social uh, well-being. Uh, so this is what I have to say. Uh, at this stage. Thank you, Savaldi. That's fantastic. I love your framing of democracy as a, as a human right and great to hear more of the context of what's been happening in Iceland. And I've certainly got some questions about uh, next steps. I hope I think some people on the uh, attending will do as well. So we're going to hand over in a moment to Valeria Vidal, who is a political advisor for Revolución Democrática, which is a one of the key political parties that's been involved in the movements in Chile to push for replacing of the current constitution. And um, I'm really excited to hear more about how that's become such a, a popular demand when it's such, it's very, it would seem very abstract um, here in the UK to most people. So 
really uh, looking forward to hear something about that. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Valeria. Welcome. Thank you all. And, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I really uh, thank you to Sam and to Lee to inviting me on this occasion. Um, in Chile, I'm concerned to process in order to begin this presentation, I must contextualize about the reality of our country and our history in democratic process. Once the presidential uh, elections won, was won by Salvador Allende, who was the world's first Marxist president in the world, uh, in the old world. He draw a lot of attention to many capitalist uh, powers. So we were put in the center of discussion in the world. The support for the agenda government began to be withdrawn and the country's economy was to be destabilized. But this was only made to have an excuse to overdraw his government. In 1973, Chile suffered a uh, cop deed in the hands of dictator uh, Augusto Pinochet, and that caused the arising of all democracy processes. Many people in our country were killed for having a different ideas ideologies, including my grandfather, who really believes in a socialist country. After that, uh, there come thousands of disappeared uh, detainees, uh, a lot of torture, uh, murder of Chilean people, and that left to deep social crisis. In order to support the action of the country's dictatorship, the uh, the high command knew that they had to rely on a constitution that did not pursue them and also because they wanted to remain in the economic power uh, the 1980 constitution uh, uh, was a support for the human rights evaluation committee in the country that constitution the current constitution uh, talks about the family, a uh, heterosexual family, about education, health, but not as basic rights. They, there is also a little protection of water, meaning that it's legal to sell the water into our private companies. Uh, we, do, we don't have any water for, for the people of Chile. This uh, belongs to the uh, private companies in, in here. Uh, it, it, it's not only here in Chile, so international companies too. Uh, all this had led us to have a, a population that works for a capitalist system, but at the expense of the, the people of our nation. The uh, scenario, Take look places last year on October 19th. It was really an uprising of the people, um, or as it was called, it, uh, social outburst. The conflict that triggered everything was a uh, rise of the subway ticket price. It was the secondary students who taught us uh, or teach us how to do it. They started avoiding ticket payments and jumping the tourniquets of the subway station. And that was enough for the whole population in Chile to take up the streets. People who have miserable pensions, feminist sexual diversity, teachers, workers in the country, they all come out. They all go to the street. What happened here? The military forces took the street up to crack us down because every street in the country, there were social manifestations in all the country, in all the cities of Chile. Uh, they go to the street uh, to, to have the manifestation in that. And, and, and 
and let us uh, know the angry of the people to be in in um, in these systems to to uh, to like in the repression system we live like today. All these movements demand their their own demands, separate demands, but all the same time, like the teacher, feminists, diversity, the pensions. And when we started to demand separately, we realized that we were joined by an only cause, one common enemy, the same constitution. And, and in November, November uh, 19, most of the Chilean politicals joining to come to an agreement that will change the constitution, but most importantly, to vote whether we, we want a new constitution or not. They opened the door of, uh, for our next constitution plebiscite. This agreement included that any decision shall be approved by uh, two thirds uh, from the people uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the people who decide uh, what to write in the constitution. It will be started to write on a blank sheet. Uh, many people and, and people will have the option to choose whatever they want in the constitution to be written by constituents from social organization, from the street, or from both, like parliamentary uh, constitution and social organization representative. That was a political agreement with uh, one purpose, uh, to stop the human rights violation that were occurring at the time in the streets. Huge, huge peaceful march was in the street and, and all the city. Uh, that was brutally surprised by the police in here, Carabineros, against children, women, and older adults. And uh, he, uh, they hit us in the street, they, and they threw tear gas uh, bombs on our, our faces and left many people blind. Uh, we were shot in the eyes and bodies. Um, it was really a war in, in the street. The president, the, the, the current president, Sebastián Piñera, who he supported the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, asked us to crack us down and hide in, and, and down him, hide in his intention, order, an idea of peace, and said, Curfew nationwide to somehow stop the undebatable revolution that exists in, 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 in Chile. The constitutional path uh, gave us a form of solution. The message was not only to decide, but also to, to all the people who want to talk. It was voted in the Congress that uh, is peer, like 50% uh, male and 50% female. Also uh, uh, like percentage of sexual diversity and another for indigenous people, like native people. We, we have never had a democracy constitution basis or process in which we uh, participate directly uh, and to say something in that. Now is our opportunity uh, to define, redefine our democracy. And this October uh, 25, it will be voted in Chile uh, if we want uh, a new constitution or if, if, if we want it. The entire country will participate in this vote and is already know that they will win a new constitution. Uh, fraud uh, uh, a constituent assembly. So uh, this is the uh, first time in, in, in my country, in Chile, to, to learn about our history and to, to redefine democracy, uh, not just for, for us, 
is for all the people and in, in, in the in the world to to see us like like this and uh, we we have very movement right now active in the street like um, organizations uh, social organizations uh like the feminist organization, organization like the, Las Tesis, uh, who who really uh, make a very impact into and 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 in, to to many um, like international people. So so that is like uh, I I I came to say to uh, to you like in the what is the process of constitution in, in in this moment to our history and the first time the Chilean people uh, can decide about us about uh, uh, the principles of us uh, and the and and be participate with with another and and realize that uh, we have the the same reality and uh, we can we can uh, again to refine this refine us so thank you for inviting me uh, it's very important for us to talk about it in the, uh, or other uh, platforms and not just in chile so i really i really excited about that um, so really <laughs> i think thank you for for this Thank you so much, Valeria. And um, it's needless to say that, like everyone on the Unlocked Democracy team, has been following the recent events in Chile with a lot of inspiration. Just seeing like how a movement blew up so so quickly and has done something that seems like a very difficult thing uh, for us to achieve here in in the UK. So we're very pleased to hear more from you about that. So we'll be moving on to the Q and A shortly, and a few people have put ones in already. So if you want to submit yours via text please take the opportunity to do so now or if you want to do it via video you can post that in the chat as well but before, before we did that i wanted to ask you both um kind of where where things stand right now and kind of what what the next steps for you, the both the movements are because in iceland we've seen that parliament is refusing to ratify um, the constitution despite mass public support. So kind of what public pressure is there at the moment to try and um, get that done? And in in Chile, um, what is the kind of what's happening next in terms of this constitution drafting process? How are the people going to be involved in that in, in the next few months? So um, Savaldi, do, do you want to address that first? And we'll go in the same order. Opinion polls have consistently shown since uh, the national referendum in 2012 that there is undiminished uh, two-thirds support uh, among the voters for the new uh, constitution. But uh, a bit like Sam described the UK case, Iceland is a place where uh, uh, members of parliament uh, can get away with almost anything between elections and then uh, frame the, uh, uh, the fight uh, that goes on for a few weeks before each election uh, in ways that uh, derail important issues. Uh, and this is how we have had the three parliamentary elections since the referendum uh, with the constitution still being held on ice. And this is uh, most unfortunate not least because these three parliamentary elections have been held according to election laws that were rejected by two-thirds of the people uh, in the 2012 referendum. We don't have one person, one vote. Uh, so we have disproportionate representation of the opponents of the new constitution from the rural areas. Uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, should not stand uh, in a democratic uh, uh, society. So there is a lot of uh, a sort of action on the ground. Uh, uh, lots of people, including a, a, an NGO called the Constitutional Society, that uh, keeps the uh, battle alive. 
Uh, the government pretends that no uh, referendum uh, took place and they are now trying uh, for the umpteenth time uh, to draft their own constitution uh, that does not have uh, uh, one person, one vote, and that does not uh, bring the ownership of the natural resources uh, from the oligarchs uh, uh, to the people of Iceland. Uh, so this is just one big fraud being committed by uh, uh, Parliament, which uh, is dragging Iceland further and further down uh, in the democracy scores kept by uh, Freedom House and uh, other such um, uh, outfits um, uh, around the world. So Iceland's democracy is really under stress in a place where you would least expect it. And that is easier for the enemies of democracy in Iceland uh, to do what they do when they look around the world and see that uh, the US democracy score has plunged even further down over the past few years than uh, has happened uh, in Iceland. So when the so-called leader of the free world misbehaves so badly on the democracy front, uh, others, you know, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, and even Iceland think that uh, they can uh, uh, do so as well. And this is, uh, to my mind, uh, most unfortunate. Thanks. Uh, Valeria, do you want to pick up on that question of um, what, what's happening right now and when, what the public will be able to participate in? Yes, I, I think about the next step of, of, of Chile. Uh, first, we will burn everything. No, it's a joke. Uh, no, never. We do it. Uh, we, we now, in, in the current, we will really know what is democracy will be. We, we don't know that. Um, the constitutions uh, will discuss our principles, but are also our law. And that is important. Uh, they will they will have the duty to represent uh, the country or the national level and uh, and politicians must answer to the inter-american court of human rights uh, participate in the violation of human rights that is the next the next step for us we can discuss about the new constitution for us, but uh, we can uh, go on um, if uh, the political like um, support the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Uh, they no pay right, for for that. And, uh, and today, there's many people in Chile who to to have injuries, serious injuries in our bodies, like uh, lost uh, the eyes because the policeman uh, shut us down. Um, so that is the next uh, step for us. And um, really the next steps uh, in the future is always act by the democracy and liberty. Um, and that is the is new for us. I really, say it, it's new for us. Um, uh, we, we I say it in a moment that uh, we know that we win the new constitution, but it's not just that. We need to to discuss and the people know the same people like it, it was all always in the power, like the people, the currently people. The, the people who support the feminist people, um, the diversity people, we need that. We need diversity in the new constitution. So it's uh, uh, um, and our history is, is really important. This process is, is really important to us. And we are uh, very happy to, to teach others about uh, our history, about this process, about uh, uh, the force uh, we, we, we put in the street, about a march, a um, peaceful march about. So I, I, I think that uh, the, the future for us uh, is, is really brightening for us. 
and 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 we can we can live uh, like in liberty now and democracy now. So uh, that is the the next uh, path for us. That's so uplifting. Thank you. And yeah, <laughs> really appreciated the point about how you know after, after such a brutal dictatorship, um, making sure that every kind of sector of society is seeing their, their future in this process and being engaged that's that's fantastic and um, there are a couple of questions on the icelandic situation that i'm hoping i can kind of condense into one so um sam Pollock has asked is there any action to pressure the government to adopting the constitution and what is the sense um that people have of what activism is needed to push this through and we've also got a question from luke that is asking and he's asking is there any anger towards the politicians who are stalling this bill? And is there a coordinated effort to vote these politicians out at the next election? And what part of the political spectrum is um, blocking it? Is it the centre, the right or, or the left? So Thavaldi, if you can address those points, that would be great, thank you. Yes, let me address the second one first. Yes, there is deep-seated anger against uh, the politicians who are uh, basically uh, uh disrespecting the will of the people as expressed in the national referendum called by parliament uh eight years ago and uh, this anger shows up in uh, various ways uh, opinion polls by gallup and others show that uh, uh the trust that uh, ordinary voters have in uh, parliament uh, sort of scrapes the bottom of the barrel uh, trust is something like 20 percent you know, it's on the level uh, of the banks. And uh, politicians somehow seem to uh, have become immune uh, uh, to these uh, findings by Gallup and others. Uh, and they continue as if uh, this is all right, because they uh, trust that they will be able to decide what will be uh, uh, on uh, uh, for discussion before the next parliamentary election and that they will be able to uh, uh, continue with business as usual. Uh, but I'm not so sure that they can because uh, Iceland is a bit like the US. Uh, there is scandal after scandal and but we only have so much time to uh, discuss and analyze each new scandal because it is replaced by a new one. So Iceland is uh, less different from Trump's America than many people would think. And this makes uh, it more difficult for uh, uh, a grassroots movement uh, uh, to uh, advance the uh, um, uh, new constitution. But I am convinced that the new constitution will uh, prevail simply because uh, if it doesn't, then Iceland has parted way with its uh, closest friends and allies, uh, uh, you know, in the post-war period, namely uh, the democracies, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the Western Alliance. And uh, that cannot be allowed to happen because uh, if the new constitution is not uh, ratified in accordance with the results of the national referendum of 2012, uh, that will make Iceland the sole country in this group of nations where a constitutional referendum has been uh, disregarded. And I think it's only a question of time before we have a new majority in parliament that uh, recognizes this and respects this. But here we come to another uh, question, and it is this. Um, isn't it unfortunate that a constitution you fit for kings, you know, 200 years ago, uh, dictates the terms under which we can uh, replace an obsolete constitution with a new and democratic one? You see, the Icelandic system is such that we can change the constitution only uh, by first having uh, it uh, ratified by parliament, and then we have a new parliamentary election, and then the second new parliament will have to ratify it as well. But you know, a constitution is meant to lay down the rules that bind politicians. So it doesn't make any sense for uh, the politicians in parliament to make up their own rules. And this is why uh, constitutional change should only uh, occur through uh, national referenda uh, without interference by politicians. This is exactly the way it was done in Philadelphia and Washington uh, in the 1780s uh, in the US, where Congress did not uh, change a single word in the uh, uh, bill that was presented to Congress from uh, uh, Philadelphia. 
And this is the way it should have been done in Iceland, but uh, they didn't do it. And they risk the exposure of more and more scandals uh, because of uh, increasing anger by the people, uh, uh, the longer they uh, keep dragging their feet. So I hope they will see the connection uh, at some stage and uh, decide that enough is enough. We have to respect the will of the people. Uh, one way to do this is to ratify the uh, constitution that was approved by an overwhelming majority of the people in the referendum of 2012, and then launch a new uh, uh, process of revision that I hope uh, will not take uh, as many years as uh, our efforts have done uh, this time. Thanks for that. That's great. And yeah, it seems like you're you're feeling very positive about the, the long term prospect and the fact that the issue of public ownership was a separate question in the referendum kind of gives even more strength to the fact that it exactly. must happen at some point. And I imagine that's why it was framed that way. Um, so next question is going back to Chile. So Matthew is asking why direct action protests against the fair rises on the metro were the spark that really ignited the democratic revolution. And uh, he's wondering if, Larry, you could shed some light on why you think that particular mo moment was what led to this explosion and all these other causes, like you say, um, deciding that their common enemy was the constitution of the old dictatorship. I, I hear it. Okay. And the question is, you, you can read me the, the question again, please. Yes, of course, of course. So um, why do you think it was that it was the fair rise protests on the metro that was the moment that sparked this gigantic response where people from all other walks of life and other movements were eventually uniting around this demand for a new constitution? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I was, uh, or, or maybe it was response to that question for the, uh, I think, uh, um, like, understand the question. Uh, the, the first, uh, the, the first movement is, was in the, in the 80th of October 80. But it's really, it was really brutal in the streets. Uh, and that many people uh, suffer the repression of the government. I, I, I don't say like uh, the regular people, it's the government who repression us. And, um, and the first, I, I say in, in the, the first uh, movement to, to, uh, to liberate us, it was the students, the secondary students, like if, if 15, 16 years old, and uh, the government, uh, um, the government um, uh, took the decision to to uh, to like repression the students too, and we all the people see it and in, in, in GTV uh, directly and uh, how to to jump the tourniquet, but we say like there is uh, the demands of. Uh, students, but we also have demands, and uh, and uh, we also suffering about uh, the dictatorship. So that uh, that is was like we say that is enough, and uh, we go to the street and and really I, I say it like a joke, but uh, but really the people want to like fire all the congressmen, uh, the government. And uh, we need that um, Sebastian Piñera, like the president, uh, go away from the country. And uh, and and, yeah, and uh, I, I first saying like I, I don't know if I read in like uh, something or our question. The 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 first to say that we we don't know have a civic education um, in Chile. Um, in our country, they took away our education, um, and and I'm a favor. I, I I'm in favor to everyone to be able to participate in this, because everyone go to the streets, so uh, they they're all really really anger to the government, 
um, and the 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 movement is not for one day or two days. It's or for month. Uh, it's uh, we expect it to go to a year, a whole year, to to be in the street. And we think like the the, the actuality, the actually um, like the COVID, uh, stopped the process for us. But uh, now the people say that we in in the in, for for the COVID and the health, they say to we have hungry, and we don't have any food because the system. The capitalist system. So they, they give us like another reason to go to the street. The people go to the street with Kobe. And, uh, um, and this process is be really difficult for us because we don't have anything. We don't have nothing. And, and, and for uh, the economy way, the social way, the democracy way. And, uh, and we, we uh, release now that we have to stop that, and and the and the way to to do that is well the democratic way for a new constitution, obviously, but we need to resign the government. We need it, really need it that uh, he go away from our country. We never uh, let like um, they uh, have the opportunity to 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 leadership our country again um, to many people no no only uh, not only in the dictatorship see only uh, same to right now uh, we lost many people um, that is the uh, they say to us like that is not the way to do it but we say that is the way to 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 have a re revolution in chile because we we suffer it right now so that is the that's the, the way we see the social movement and they save us they save all of us thanks so much valeria um there's a couple of questions i wanted to squish together for both of you to pick up on and Valeria, you might you might feel like you've already addressed this but feel free to chip in with any additional insights so and um, Rebecca is saying that, do you think people need to have a basic level of political literacy to take democratic action? Or is it the role of third parties to galvanize and challenge, um, I'm sorry, to channel that social action? Um, perhaps where people want change on an issue, but don't know how to go about winning that change. And Anna has also asked, do you have any insights into how people who weren't politically involved, how they started to support this constitutional movement um because you know it doesn't it doesn't immediately feel like something material but what i'm hearing from valeria is that a lot of people just didn't feel like had any alternative and that it just kept growing and growing and growing so anything else you want to um, add to that would be uh, great and so i'll do um feel free to do the same yes um the constitutional uh, battle in iceland has been fought mostly by people who have never been involved in politics uh, half of the people who were elected to sit on the Constitutional Council, including myself, had never been politically active. So this was a non-political project, even if the Constitution, of course, contains uh, uh, provisions that are um, basically uh, uh, designed to uh, uh, regulate political life, uh, uh, among other things. So. Um, Political uh, participation or activism uh, is, I think, uh, secondary. You ask about uh, literacy and education. Education, obviously, is always very desirable and very important. But my experience is that uh, in the constitutional battle, uh, the uh, people with uh, limited education have been just as enthusiastic as those uh, with uh, more education. And this is because, you know, the uh, uh, uh constitution is different from so the day to day, day legislation uh, it is a matter of uh, of uh, fair play of uh, uh of the rules of the game 
that the people from all walks of life uh, take to their heart. And it has been very uh, encouraging for me to, uh, to witness this uh, firsthand in Iceland. Okay, thanks. Hello, do you want I am to... sorry. Yes, if you want to add something. <laughs> okay. To sorry. I was waiting, like you, you say, Valeria, go on. <laughs> um, I, like I, I said before, like uh, we, first of all, we don't have civil education in, in Chile. Um, because they, they took our education in the, in the Constitution, we don't have the, the right to educate. We have the access to educate, ed educate. Uh, and that is like the public education, and the private education. The private education is much better for, for no things, but the public education now is, is not like the, the way in, 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 in our country. And, and that I say, I, I, I'm in favor of everyone be able to participate in this. Um, and the, we will give us, they give us the reality of country. Uh, that is not written in the book. Uh, you, you, you see in the real life. And we needed that. We need human and uh, new constitution, uh, reality human. Um, and, and, and they, they, we have to, to see that in, in the new constitution for us. We cannot start the st this story without all the people of the country. Uh, we have a different uh, uh, way to think, like um, uh, the capital capitalist uh, way, the communist way, the social uh, way, but we, we all had to write in the, in the, new, the new constitution because Oh, if if we don't, we repeat the story, and we don't we we don't want that. Um, we uh, we have to get up together in the in the in the new scenario. I believe that ordinary people should be given the opportunity to decide for ordinary people, and th that is that is really the voice. There is. Uh, in, in that moment, in that places, there is the really power voice for the people, and we need that in the new constitution. So no, I think uh, no, all the people had like a, a really straight education. Uh, we think, or, or I think, we need it like from democracy uh, realities and the people and and, and the ordinary people can give us that. Very inspiring words again that the, the answer lies with the people. So, um, so there's, there's a question here um, from Kelsey, which is referring mainly to the Icelandic experience, which is basically, you've got a situation like this where there's a very clear public mandate for the change but it's being held up by established political power so it seems to me um the question is what you know what, what structures should be put in in place to kind of stop that happening in the future so did the the draft constitution that hasn't been um, ratified for example does that contain provisions to stop a situation like this arising in the future uh, not specifically but uh, the new constitution has uh, many uh different provisions that are uh, designed to enhance democracy in Iceland. One is uh, a provision that um, describes uh, increased use of national referenda to uh, decide questions that uh, politicians should be glad that they will then be relieved from having to uh, settle uh, for themselves, including, for example, uh, the question of European Union mem membership. Uh, the politicians should be grateful for a constitutional provision that uh, refers several important uh, political decisions uh, to the people, because that will simplify the work of the politicians. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, 
uh, well, this is one of the reasons why the politicians, many of them are uh, uh, negative toward the new constitution bill. Not only that, several of them are trying to arrange things in such a way that the people of Iceland, if they want to, will not even be able to join the European Union uh, on the strength of the outcome of a national referendum. So uh, some of them want to go uh, the, the other way and that is uh, 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 not good. <laughs> Uh, from my point of view. The, uh, what can be done uh, as is? Well, only thing that, uh, what we can do is simply continue the fight, convince more and more uh, uh, people that this will not stand and try to convince the political parties, some of them, that they really cannot look the other way and hope to get a new uh, majority in parliament uh, that will ratify the new constitution. Uh, if not, you know, we may th have to think of uh, other means uh, for the will of the people to be uh, respected. But what form that will take, uh, uh, I cannot say, but I keep saying that uh, uh, um, the more scandals we have, uh, the weaker the political class will be and the weaker will be their uh, resistance uh, to the ratification of the constitution to respect the will of the people. Great stuff, thank you. Um, so we've got a question from Millie who's asking what your recommended reading would be in favour of democracy because they're mentioning there's a lot of anti-democratic thinking that's been um, published as well. So one of my favourites is a, a recent book by Astra Taylor called Democracy May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, I know there's a really rich Spanish um, tradition of writing about democracy as well, but any, any text either of you would recommend that really put the case that you're making? I would recommend the Journal of uh, Democracy an academic journal across uh, multidisciplinary that is published uh, uh, in California. Uh, very uh, informative uh, uh, articles uh, that come out, you know, so four times a year or something. Valeria, what would you add to that list? Uh, for like reading or uh, something? To yeah, the, so to book, books, for example, that really make a principled case for participation i will recommend the books of my country <laughs> i think <laughs> so i know like that international but we have really good books in, uh, of reading about democracy like teachers about constitution rights and the human rights uh, we we have like uh, like books uh, from monde diplomatic that uh, they they uh, write in by uh, columns uh, writing about the reality of Chile and the political way to to do it in Chile. Um, I, I I always read it. Um, it's, it's it's also online. So Monday Diplomatic. Um, I I see like in the 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 New Yorker the New Yorker Times uh, because they put like our president. <laughs> uh, they say like the bad president of the world, Chile, Sebastián Piñera. So I really like it when when I read it. Uh, I recommend that to like uh, uh, like always be informed uh, and know what is happening in the world. No, it's just in 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 our countries. So I I recommend that uh, reading and. and and outside uh, countries and outside people, um, and oh, and well, on diplomatic, I, I like it. I really like that. Great, thanks both. So this will, this will be the last but one question now. So the I want to put one to you, Valeria. So Anna's asking, how did different groups of so feminists, students, workers, indigenous people, and, and other groups? come together and realize that rewriting the constitution was their common way to make real change. You've already talked about the repression of the government. You've already talked about how um, the Pinochet regime changed the constitution so that it wouldn't be pursued for its crimes. But um, how, how did that process happen in the, in the last couple of years of finding the same common enemy? 
uh, I said that before in, in my speech. We 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 united because we all suffer under dictatorship, and that is the motive to go to the street. But in one moment, we we say like we see us like we must to be united in in this moment of history, and we we all been discriminated about uh, uh, for the government and against and we rely release that we must change the origin of the constitution we see that and we understand that uh, from the from the the movement of education from the movement of, of or, or uh, like uh, abortion rights from the feminists for example uh, sexual education uh, we we don't have that in in Chile. We we don't know that uh, civic education um, and the labor rights, like the the, the workers and the, and, and for our country, and 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 yes, I it it was the best de decision to join um, together and uh, and regardless of our difference, uh, because we when when we see it together, we are stronger. The, the 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 from the injustice in, the, in in our country, we really are stronger than that. Fantastic! Thank you so much. So, final question for you both. Then, so in Valeria's case, what things would you personally like to see in a new constitution? And for Thavaldia, what what are your kind of favourite points from the draft constitution that has yet to be implemented? So yeah, Valeria, do you want I, to go I, first? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I had to say like uh, reproductive and sexual rights first. Uh, recognition of diversity, diversity in our constitution, like uh, lesbian, homosexual people, bisexual people. We need rights. Really, really uh, we need rights like uh, marriage the same sex uh, we don't have that in in, in chile uh, i i say uh, labor rights uh, from the for the workers uh we have the right to to uh, a better health and the system we don't give us and um, and uh, that is my favorite uh like per perspective in the constitution is the law with a gender uh, perspective. Uh, this, uh, if, if we have that, we can change the, the way to see a feminist and the way to see like justice. If we have the gender perspective and uh, we have to, we, we, we need that opportunity to see that and, 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 and have law about that. Uh, that is uh, like the the right and base my experience and the and the work I I, I do in, in in my in my country. The, there is really really important talked about it because the constitution uh, from the 1980 in, in our country they don't give us and they, they, there is no exist in in this constitution. So this is modern. This is revolutionist from the constitution we have to talk about that and, and write in, in in the new constitution great thank you Pavelia, last word from you then yes uh in iceland we do have those rights that uh, valerie wants for um, uh, chile um, my two favorite uh, uh provisions in the new constitution that remains to be ratified by the icelandic parliament are the ones that i emphasized in my uh, introduction one is uh, national ownership or natural resources, and the other is uh, electoral reform that gives us uh, one person, one vote. And the remarkable thing about those two provisions is that they have to do with human rights. Uh, the United Nations Committee on Human Rights uh, declared in 2007 the Icelandic method of uh, allocating fishing licenses to oligarchs uh, 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 constitutes a violation of human rights. And uh, European election observers have also said that the uh, unequal weight of votes in Iceland uh, constitutes a violation of human rights. 
and uh, human rights violations uh, because of uh, progress that has been made in uh, legislation over the past uh, couple of decades uh, can be taken to foreign courts as is. So in other words, the uh, violations that the Parliament of Iceland is uh, uh, committing by holding the uh, Constitution uh, uh, hostage uh, can be uh, construed as a violation of human rights that can give rise to litigation in uh, foreign courts. So the globalization of law is one avenue that we may have to uh, uh, try if uh, the uh, Icelandic parliament does not uh, uh, realize that uh, it cannot uh, go on doing what it has been doing over the past uh, seven years. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much to both of you for giving us such fantastic insights into the democratic struggles in your countries this evening, especially in these times. It's very um, powerful to kind of um, build these across uh, border um, discussions and, and friendships. So thank you so much for that tonight. And I've really found it interesting to think about how in Iceland, I think it's fair to say that the, the struggles that are linked to the constitution are very much economic, whereas in Chile, it's also economic, but there are many social rights for women, for indigenous groups, for um, uh, LGBT people that are very behind and the, the, the con drafting a new constitution which replaces the old regime is a way of advancing those um, social rights depending on kind of what, what is lacking from people's rights in a country. So I'm very excited to think more about that in the future and to bring those ideas to the UK where we can be talking to people about how we don't have the right to this, we can only get this right and protect it by changing the whole makeup of our constitution, the whole way that our democracy works. So thank you so much um, for that uh, for that this evening. So I'll just draw us to a close now. Um, our next event is in a couple of weeks' time and it's entitled A Broken Contract, Business, Citizen and States with Peter Gagan. And she has spent a couple of years very deeply researching, amongst other things, the um, cheating that the uh, Pro Leave campaign did um, in the in the UK, overspending on its um, spent uh, illegally overspent the amount that it was allowed to spend in the campaign, and lots of um, corruption in general is being unearthed in that book. So that's going to be a really exciting uh, talk. So you'll receive a link on how to join that in the thank you email you get after this, but. Um, I've already mentioned uh, earlier on our democratic um, futures principles and we're currently getting people to add their name to that to start building a campaign to change the conversation about democracy in the UK. So you'll also have a link to that in the email you get shortly. So please do sign up to that and we want people to get in involved in shaping that campaign. So please get in contact with us either by replying to that email or by using the social media links you can see now to, to find out more about that. So um, I hope you're all staying safe wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I hope to um, speak to you all again soon. And one last thanks to our panelists for tonight, Valeria and Thobaldia. Thanks again. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Bye.